Welcome to episode 13 of A Conversation About. Kevin joins us again. This time we're going to be talking about The Prince. And I'm not entirely sure if you can see it, but it's a picture of uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. It's one of his most famous works. It's very much a controversial read. Um, so I'm very interested in what you have to say, Kevin. Um, given that you just read it, I just recommended it to you. Um, but first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming back. Um, it's very nice to see you again. Yeah, this was a uh, a very interesting book to say the least. Um, yeah, it was so short, and I, I looked at it. and I was like, "Oh, this this will be a quick read. I can do this in about an hour or something." <laughs> and I read through this, and no, it took me about a, if I combined it, maybe a, a good six hours because it was a really dense read, and you have to read things twice because it was very, very like the English was just. Yeah. It's not. It's not simple English. Yeah, the so. translation. Even like even with the translation, it's not simple English. And I thought the same thing when I picked it up. I heard about the book like years ago, and like growing up, you kind of hear the term Machiavelli, and you kind of associate it with bad things. So I thought, why don't I read the book and see what's up? And I saw it was 100 pages. So it's like, okay, this is digestible. I can read it in a couple of a couple of hours. I read some, so I can read it in a couple of hours. But it, I think it took me over a day just because I had to reread some parts. And then even then I like threw on the audiobook and listened along with it just because like some parts were like really difficult to understand at times, but it's a short book and it is digestible if you want to read it. And I 100% recommend that everybody reads it. Um, but I want to ask you your initial like reactions, your initial take on The Prince. Well, it was one of um, shock, shock. Because mm -hmm. um, I know I told you when, I, when you first gave the book, I was like, oh, this could help me in some things, um, since I, I like I am in leadership in a lot of things. But then when I read it, there's two aspects of the book. The first aspect being the uh, you're a prince, you're about to take office, be in charge. There's that aspect, and in that way, no, it was not really. That's the more shocking part, and it did not. It was not so helpful for me. But then there was the other part that had more life, self-help, thought. And in that regard, it was there was some pretty good advice in there. So I, I had pretty mixed feelings, but overall, I, I was definitely shocked. Yeah, I mean, I was shocked too. So to put this into context, Niccolo Machiavelli is a man that grew up in like the 14 or 1500s. Uh, pardon me, I can't exactly remember. He was like a low-level bureaucrat. Um, I don't know if you know like his history or anything, but I'll give you like a brief rundown and for people listening. He was a low-level bureaucrat. His dad was like a politician, some kind of lawyer. Um, and he also was like some kind of politician at a time when the Medici family was in power in Italy. Um, and so like he spent time under two different regimes. Um, the Medici family was initially there and he was helping them. And then a different family came into power. And then when the Medici family came back, they saw him working in... Um, in the politics, in politics, you know, as a bureaucrat with the other family, so they threw him in jail. He's like, oh, you're part of the enemy. Um, and in jail is when he starts, in prison, he starts reading um, and he starts, like, learning about social things. Mm -hmm. He starts, um, a lot of this book is, like, case studies on, like, what previous dictators, what previous emperors, um, like Alexander Great and things, um, and people of that nature have done. Um, and that's when he starts, like, compiling, like, some anecdotes, some case studies and stuff. So... He was like not this big dictator, not this big ruler. He was like low level politician. Um, but some of his like political ideologies, political philosophy, because he's not necessarily a philosopher either. Some of those philosophies are, I mean, impactful to the say. Like this, this version itself is um, commented on by Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, like it's been in the pockets of like very big uh, dictators. Uh, almost every leader at this point has to have read at least some part of the Prince, if not all of the Prince, because of how short it is. Um, so that's why I think it's like really interesting to at least know what people talk about when you say Machiavelli. So you don't just like throw the phrase around, but I mean, I agree. There's, uh, you get shocked because mm -hmm. at one point you're like, okay, some of this is making sense. You get lost in some of the case studies. And like you said, like there's some self-help in there. There's some like, there's some growth. There's some, there's some thinking about the world in a different way. One of the main things I took away from the book was that it is ideal to maintain the status quo no matter what. Mm -hmm. That was like a very big overarching theme in the book in general, whether 
So he talks about like when you come into power by inheritance, when you come. So the book is written to a, a cousin of his, a nephew of his, if I'm not mistaken. The book is written to a nephew of his that's going to be a prince soon. Prince being king, um, but he refers to him as a prince. Um, so he's going to be a king soon. We'll say prince to follow along the storyline. Um, and he says, you're going to come into power here in the next coming years. Here's what other leaders have done to maintain power. Here's what other leaders have done successfully. Here's what they've done bad. Here's what I advise you do. So he's writing this manuscript on how to advise his nephew on how he can be a good dictator, a good prince, a good ruler. And one of the interesting things is like, so he talks about people that come into power by inheritance, people that come into power by, by power, people that come into power by random chance, and then people that come into power by like support of others. And I'm sure I'm missing a category here and there, um, or misquoted one, but there are some aspects of that where you're like, wow, he's being really brutally honest and really like telling you you should do some savage things. And then the other ones, it's like, okay, you know, this, this isn't so bad. He's talking about the status quo. He's talking about keeping things cool. Don't raise taxes and things like that. So I had mixed emotions. I know I just ranted for a while, but no, yeah, you one one page or one chapter you're talking about like something light, like oh yeah, this is some good advice. Next minute you're talking about getting rid of the person who you hired to do a bad job for you to to, to cover your own self. So yeah, it, it's like one. It's just shock. Like okay, wow. Yeah, it, so it, you're right. Like from page to page, it changes, and that was actually a really interesting thing where he talked about like scapegoats and stuff. Like if we're being brutally honest here. We know that politicians and people in power sometimes have to do things that aren't very, like, appealing to the public, that don't look good, uh, that are borderline bad, that are borderline unethical and things like that. We know that things like this kind of happen in politics, whether we like it or not, whether it's, like, in America or in a different country. I mean, there's, there's dictators all over the world that do really bad things. So we know these kind of things happen, but... What was interesting is he's like, if you're going to do these kind of bad things, have someone do it for you so you don't necessarily have your hands, um, you know, dirty. You can, you know, just say, oh, it was him. He did these bad things and then kick him out of your camp. Mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting thing to talk about because, like, intuitively that makes sense. But until somebody puts it down on paper and, like, we read it, we're like, oh, okay, now we recognize it. Yeah. Um, so, like, I was thinking about that and, like, thinking of, you know, um, think of Napoleon Bonaparte and his whole like history for coming to power in France, or even um, no, I'll just leave it to him because I, I really can't think of anything else. But yeah, I'll leave it to him. But like how he had you know ministers and different people running different sectors of the country, France at the time, mm -hmm. um, and I think like he gave some like. He gave some of the worst jobs, like some of his less like generals. Like, I think he gave. I know he liked. So initially, he hated there was general or marshal, marshal Massena, and he initially hated him. But throughout their campaign and war, they became friends. But he sent him to Spain, which is like where you, if you were a general, you don't want to go because of how complex that situation was. And so he went to Spain and he failed, and then he was removed from his job. And it makes it easy to say, well, it's just because he's a failure. But when Napoleon was the mastermind behind the plan, and he's like, well, if this doesn't work, at least I can say it was his fault. And, you know, that it, it's interesting to read because, I, like we were talking about earlier, like some of this stuff kind of like intuitively makes sense just because maybe we've grown up around it, these things. Mm -hmm. But I, I really think that, like, until we read it and we, like, process it, it's like, whoa, like, okay, this is, we can step back and say, oh, maybe this is happening, and it is happening in, like, in everyday life. And that goes on to like a broader topic, which is like, how do you keep the people happy? Should you keep the people happy? Um, should you appease the nobles or should you appease uh, the populace? You know, what, like, how do you balance that? And so he talks about different in regards to different ways that you can come to power, he talks about different approaches. In some approaches, it might be more beneficial to appease the nobility because they are the ones that can, like you said earlier, you know, talk to the people um, and like distribute your messages.
But on the other side, sometimes it's easier to talk to the people and keep the people happy and don't let the nobility get too powerful because then they can overthrow you. No, I agree. Um, and another thing I even thought of too, I didn't mention this, but um, another thing I thought of as well, if you have the people angry at you, which are the numbers, and you have the nobility, which has the money, that's, that's not a really good combo right there. So um, I think that, honestly, yeah, I would go with the people rather than the nobility because they have the numbers. I think so too, and I, I would go with the people too, and I think... I think he kind of made this point kind of subtly when he talks about, so he talks about some very cruel things if we're being brutally honest here, but he talks about when you get into power and it's by force or it's by anything other than like a peaceful transition, the first thing you need to do is go in and kill anybody who has the opportunity to revolt against you. Say, the brother of the king or, you know, whatever it may be in the royal family, the nobility and that kind of stuff, you need to get rid of them because if they have any kind of chance to, you know, bring a revolt up against you, they will just because of like the revenge and all these sentimental feelings about the previous regime and power. So it was interesting because it makes sense, you know, like when you come into power, you want to eliminate your enemies as soon as you can. But, I mean, some of that stuff is, like, very brutally honest. And that was, like, one of the hard things to take back from the book. Yeah, even I, I think another part of the book even talks about, like, would you rather be loved or would you rather be feared? Yes. And uh, clearly, Machiavelli, Ma Ma yeah, Machiavelli mm -hmm. would prefer to be feared. Yeah, and I think, so that's, like, that question right there and do the means justify the ends, which we'll talk about later, are, like, one of the biggest philosophical questions that you can bring out of this book, even though he wasn't a philosopher, but like, do you want to be feared or do you want to be loved? And like part of this, and there's a, like a second, there's a second statement that comes out of that, which is better the devil, you know, than the one you don't or something to that effect, mm -hmm. you know, better the, the, the bad things that you know, than you know, changing everything for the good things, you know, and that's something a dictator can hold on to. He can, a dictator can probably say, hey, you know, you're not happy with life under me, but if you throw me over, the guy you're going to put in is going to make life way worse. So like to kind of appease the people. But I mean, yeah, do you want to be feared or do you want to be loved? Well, you want to be loved by the people. And I think this is something he, he mentions. You want to be loved by the people and feared by your enemies. But you want to be feared overall. You just don't want to be seen as cruel. That was like the different dimensions. So there's love, fear, and then there's cruelty. Because mm -hmm. you can be feared for bad things you do, but you don't want to be perceived as cruel. Because if people are are fear are, are fearsome of you, I guess that's the word, um, when people are, are scared of you, they're less likely to revolt against you. But when they're scared of you and they think you're cruel, that just fuels a fire for revenge. Yeah, I think um, if you're feared, like... Or, okay, I think in the context of this, is that if I was a person, like, living in this time, there was a dictator, right? Um, obviously, if you're cruel, you're going to have some semblance of, like, wanting to be vengeful or revenge or whatever. But if you are, um, if you're fearful, I don't, like, if you're on the, if you're on the king's good side, good side, so to speak, I don't think you have really a reason to be fear, fearful. I mean, like, you don't have it, like, in the back of your mind, like, you have no real reason afraid so and i think that's what the book was talking about like if you're on the good side like you treat the good people good you treat them well but the people who aren't good you you know you make them fear you without you know going overboard you're making them without seeming cruel yeah and so actually to pick up on that um you want to be good to people but this is this is something so like machiavellian I guess, in, in like in popular or modern society, something so Machiavellian is the idea that you want to do good to the people, but you want to keep them addicted to that good because then they get complacent or they start, I guess, getting complacent is not exactly the word. They start getting used to the good things you're doing. So like if you get, if you're at work and work brings you pizza every Friday, the one Friday that they don't bring you pizza is the Friday you're going to remember not the other Fridays that you've gotten, you know? So like you start building this resentment. So I think one of the things he talked about was 
when you do good things, you want to do them in small increments to keep people addicted to you, to say, well, at least he gives us, you know, bread on Thursdays or something, you know, but like you don't want to give them bread every day because then they come to expect it. And when you don't do that, then that's when you really start upsetting the people. And that was like, so it's so Machiavellian, Machiavellian, so deceitful. So like, I don't, I don't even know, like, so I don't even know if like sociopathic or this is like, I don't even know what the word is for it. It's just like so cruel to keep people addicted to good things, but it makes sense. You know, like it, it just, to me, it, it intuitively makes sense. Yeah, when you're in power, you want to try to stay in power. And I guess yeah. to Machiavelli, that was the best way to do that. Um, I think I think another one that I liked was that um, where he was talking about come, when you come to power, immediately like appeasing, appeasing nobility and whatnot. Um, nobility and people, sorry. So obviously when you come to power, you want to you know, make sure everyone's happy with you coming in. And, obviously crush crush those who who oppose you but those who are like not necessarily who like you or not necessarily like you but don't hate you enough to want to rebel against you openly you you want to try to appeal and appease those groups and to mm -hmm. kind of like neutralize them um to make them friendly or at least keep them in check yeah and that's in, that's interesting too because like he said I don't know if he set like a literal boundary for it, but like he set a boundary where he's like, if it looks like those people aren't going to be swayed your way, then you do whatever you can to either make them your enemy or completely get them on your side. Because the people you should fear the most are the ones that are indifferent against you. Because if you come in and you like, you know, kill the noble family, and these are very harsh topics. Um, mm -hmm. If you kill the noble family and like the nobility and stuff, then there's no one that can rebel against you, right? Um, if you come in with power like that, I don't even know where I was going with that actually. <laughs> uh, but so we were kind of talking about, how do you say, and now I've completely lost it, which is okay. What were we talking about? Um, so I was like on a train, yeah. I was trying to connect two things and then yeah. like, I, I, I tried thinking about a, a word to say and I completely lost it. Yeah. One like nobility. Um, uh, yes, you should be fearful of the people that can be swayed either way. Yeah, in different because, people. Yeah, in different people. That's the word. Um, in different people. Because those are the people that don't fear you for your cruelty and don't respect you for the good things you've done. And those are the ones that can really be swayed to come and get you. Because when you come into power, and the, this is where I was going, when you come into power through force, your enemies are going to say, oh, wow, he was strong enough to conquer the, the king, the, the royal family and stuff. Let's back off. This guy is mm -hmm. too strong. We can't take him. And the people are like, well, we can't do anything about it. And he's giving, you know, he has us addicted to the good things. It's the people that aren't scared of you and the people that aren't like, okay, maybe he's okay. Those are the ones you should really be fearful of. Yeah, no one likes uh, the indifferent people, the uh, people who are in the middle. They don't like them. Yeah. Aside. So, no, no, that, that's definitely, that was a good point in the book. I, I, didn't, I don't remember that one per se, but no, that was a good point to make as well. Yeah, and I was trying to connect two different things, and I completely lost it um, because there's just so much in this book. Like, it's like a hundred pages, but, but like every lot. page is, is a lot. It's a lot, and it's like I started thinking about that, and I, but he said this, and my mind just goes all over the place. Um, or even like the part of the book that was like talking about um, castles, like mm, yes, yes. If you're like, there's just so much. You know, it doesn't make sense to build a castle if your enemies are within, like. It's kind of pointless at that point. Uh, it had some good points. And yeah, and um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Like, so, on the, in terms of building castles, there was a section where he talked about, man, there's so much in this book. Um, there's a section where he talked about when you come into power, you need to set up little outposts everywhere mm -hmm. and like keep very trusted people in charge if you're not going to be there yourself. Because you need to make sure that people understand who is in power, and like are following your your laws, and you know are you know accepting the change the regime the right way. And you want to do that in certain like very strategic places because if one town starts revolting, you want to have like an outpost ready to shut down that revolt. And it was interesting how he talked about, and, it, and especially in a in a forceful regime change, you really want to have like some kind of like supervision on 
on the outskirts of town and like all these people that could like potentially um, revolt against you. And one of the things he talked about was when you're making this outpost, and this is where we talk about like the means justifying the ends, when you're like building an outpost, one of the things you should do, and it's very, it's very, very harsh, but he talks about how people will forget if you go in and burn a house down like it, let's say, like in the in the, in the town, there's like one family that is very likely to revolt against you. People will forget that you destroyed that house and killed that family if you um, come in and don't change much else and have them addicted to that good thing. They'll forget that you did those bad things. They'll know you did them, but they'll kind of forget. They'll know you're cruel and they'll fear you a little bit, but they'll kind of forget as long as mm -hmm. you're you know giving them good things. And it's like just making a presence and like doing what you need to do to establish that presence, whether it be killing the people that it could revolt against you because the populace will forget or like maybe like not increasing taxes in the beginning, like all about trying to keep a status quo, but being very swift about asserting your power. Yeah, always be, yeah. one thing was be swift with whatever you do. Another one that I liked was um, the, with the servants. Like having that same treatment of your servants, your like personal close aides or whatever, mm -hmm. or friends, I guess. If in our in our sense, it would be friends, not servants. Yeah. So, um, I liked how he also kind of had that same thought for servants as well, giving them yeah. good things or whatever. I'll just say good things for lack of better words, but giving them good things, mm -hmm. um, and keeping them close but not too close. Yeah, but and. And so like he talked about that and then he talked about having like maybe one person that like you always trust that you let them speak out against you you know so people understand that you're not i think it was like have some kind of like very trusted person that like, even in public will speak out against you and like people know that you trust them so they know that like you're trying to do what's best for everybody so you have that image and so you keep yourself grounded too so like you keep your servants close and you keep them good, but you keep someone even closer that is able to critique you. So you don't let the power get to your head, I mm -hmm. guess. And yeah, that that is some good advice if you're in any leadership role. That's very good advice. Yeah. Um, though, I don't know if I would limit it to one person. Criticism is always good to have. Mm -hmm. um, but no, that, that was good advice. To, so to, a lot to of these, well. a lot of these themes, I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. Um, a lot of these themes are like, they seem to be like out there in the world, like in this book, they seem to be very like philosophical and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I know you kind of thought about this and I kind of thought about this too. Like, how do we implement this? Or how do we recognize some of these things in everyday life? Not necessarily implement because there's pretty dark things in there. Yeah. Um, but like, how do we recognize some of these things in everyday life? And that's like, that's one of them, you know, keep friends close and have a good circle of friends that can critique you, that can help you grow. So they keep you grounded and stuff. And there are some things that like, even though we're talking about this philosophical book written like 500 years ago, there's there's something we can pull out of it. I, I, I don't know if you can get like some of the deeper philosophical, well, let me change that. You can get some of the deeper philosophical things there. But if you just take the book at face value, you might think, oh, you know what, you, I need to put this away and like, no, it exists, but put it away. And only think about it when you like see another ruler doing some bad things and say like a dictator of X country right now is starting to do some things that are kind of Machiavellian. Then you're like, okay, I know what he's talking about. But like maybe some of the things here, are, like keeping your friends close, um, letting know, letting your enemies know, which I mean, in everyday life, do you really have enemies like that? But like letting your enemies know what you're capable of so they can yeah, back you have down. To, you have to eliminate them. Yes. <laughs> eliminate your enemies. Um, don't quote me on that, that he said it, not me. Yeah, no, I, I don't know how you go and eliminate them without like, going to jail. But okay. Yeah. yeah um, so don't do that. But yeah. um, No, the, uh, the thought of like, so some things that were applicable, like the thought of applying some things, that one being, that being one, um, there was another one. I don't remember what it was. Um, it wasn't the status quo. It wasn't. I already mentioned the the keeping people close mm -hmm. and being grounded in some regard. Um, maybe it'll come back to me. But there there was something else I had that was pretty good for application. So I think another, or not another, but. A section I kind of want to keep on for a little bit was maintain the status quo. Okay. So, 
And we can kind of think about this right now, especially since the U.S. just came out of a presidential election a couple months ago, um, a very difficult presidential election because of like people not willing to accept the results of it. Um, not a majority of people, but enough people to make some noise um, and make some really big noise is how do you maintain the status quo when there's a regime change or where there's a change in people in power? And one of the interesting things he talked about here that even though it was 500 years ago, still applicable today, he's like, first of all, don't change the laws. Second of all, don't mess with the taxes. Whatever people are used to, let them stay used to that. Like, do something to try to maintain the status quo. Yeah, another one, okay, now that you mentioned that too, another one that I saw, or I remember, was that you were to keep, um, like, establish, like, some sort of oligarchy system. Like, mm -hmm. you're in charge, yes, but you have some, like, puppet leader mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, because it's it's one of them, like it's it's their ruler, but obviously you're you're the one in charge. Yes, yeah, yeah, the, right. Like to try to keep you're right, exactly. So it's it kind of like the scapegoat stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. Like so you you can have a familiar face to them um, that you are ruling through, you are like speaking through, so that people have some kind of like familiar sense. Because he talks about one of the case studies. I can't remember who it was now. Um, I think it was someone in France, like a French ruler or something, that as soon as he came into power, he rose taxes, he started killing people and all these other things. And it's like he was in power for not long because the people revolted against him. Like mm -hmm. they were not happy with the way the taxes were being increased, not happy with how many people were dying. And that's that's fuel for, for a revolt. Yep. And Those so he's terrorists. like, you need to, yeah, you need to. You need to do whatever you can to diminish any chances of revolts. And a lot of that is just maintaining the status quo. You don't even have to... He talks about, like, be merciless when necessary, but if you can opt for a choice of, like, keeping people safe and not doing violent things, you should do that just because it looks better. Yeah. Public... One thing in the book I remember is public opinion is always important. Yeah. Perception to the general public, the, the people. So... If you want to be a populist, don't make the population mad. And you know, that sounds like so intrinsically, intuitively, and like, I don't know, obvious, but yeah, don't make people mad. Right? But like, as soon as people come into power, and like, we can see this kind of like, I hate making blanket terms like throughout history, but like, we have seen rulers come into power and like just completely piss people off. And it's like, how long did you last in power? Like, and. Obviously, some of this makes sense. You know, you made your people mad, so the people were going to come out against you, whether it be vote you out or like literally force you out of power. Yeah, in Napoleon's case, because I know Napoleon had like footnotes in the book. Mm -hmm. Napoleon's case, people were tired of conflict for twenty-five, no, for ten years. They were tired of the conflict. They wanted out. Um, so when you know the rulers of Austria, Russia, and mm -hmm. Germany, I believe, were Prussian in a sense. When they all yeah. invaded Russia, and they, when they all invaded France, sorry, and they finally got to Paris, the people didn't go up in arms. They were they actually <laughs> they were, they were happy. <laughs> yeah. They were like, finally, yes, this war is over. Yeah, and so like, it's why it, I think it's so interesting. And unfortunately, I haven't like read all of the comments by uh, Napoleon on on this book, but that's so why I think it's so interesting because like. There are, these are real world examples. This isn't like some thought experiment in the philosophical world. Like you can see the real world example of like someone pissing their people off, someone exhausting their people through battles and wars, such to the point that they were like, okay, the enemy's coming, but honestly, it might even be better with them, you know? And so like he was, I don't know this for sure, but I get this idea that Napoleon was kind of hanging on to this idea of like better the devil you know, me, than the one you don't, them. So it's like, okay, I may be treating you crappy, or I may be giving you like a really bad life, but they're going to be worse. And then it comes up, comes to be that, you know, they start invading, and they're like, well, you know, let's just see what this is because we're kind of tired of this guy. And that, I mean, that complacentness too, and that, not complacent, but that like difference in thought, like being more open to these opportunities once you see how bad a ruler can be, is like part of that like saving face, part of that like keeping a good identity, like you said, if you want to be a popular ruler, you have to keep the populace happy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the book touches this, but um, does it talk about like, um, oh wait, no, it's not left me. Um, 
Awfully, okay, clearly back there. There's so much in this book. Like, yeah. The, the, it's not that we're like just losing, <laughs> losing our minds here. There's just so much in this book. I and mean, in these hundred pages, it's like, it's really easy to like just get different ideas from, because it's so dense. So wait, okay, we were talking about uh, Napoleon coming in, taking power. Mm -hmm. um, like, so does it talk about um, how, like, I guess, like, okay, so obviously in, Fra in, in France's case, mm -hmm. um, Napoleon was, you know, he, he was forcefully removed from power, mm -hmm. but he did come back for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and when the people came, or when, when you know, they when the coalition established back the, the war path, Bourbon, or Bourbon, monarchy mm -hmm. again, and they reestablished them back in. Obviously, it didn't take long for them to kind of hate them again. Um, so, I don't know if the book touches on the fact of like, okay, well, you've been ousted, but you come back. Here's how you do it, better, two point oh, yeah, new I mean, and improved. So I don't know if it touches on that. I know there was a section where he said there was a leader in France, and a lot of this is focused on Alexander the Great and French rulers. Mm -hmm. There are some previous Italian rulers that he does some case studies on. Um, but he's like, this guy was set up to be um, a perfect ruler. He was set up to be, you know, um, he was going to be good. But here's like the four fatal flaws he made. Like, I think he lost power in that regard and then came back and like he made another flaw or like he made another mistake somewhere in there. Um, I think there was some guidelines in the book about like when you come back to power, like kind of people recognize you. But I think in general, he was of the attitude that like once people understand that you're like a crappy ruler, that's kind of it for you because people are like, no matter how close you keep the nobility, people will revolt against you. And I wanted to ask you something else, but we'll, I think we can like jump into the whole saving face and appearances aspect of this book because in the hundred pages there is a lot in this. There is a significant time, there's significant time dedicated to talking about how a leader should compose himself, um, how a leader should appear, you know, um, friendly. We talk about being like cruel, loved, feared. Um, religious, amoral, doing moral things, um, and these kind of things. And the most, one of the most interesting quotes I can ever extrapolate from this book is, a leader should appear to be all of these things while doing none of them. And that, that was, that was like so eye-opening if you like look at it that way, because like you look at leaders, you look at leaders even like in American history or mm -hmm. any kind of history, and you're like, wow, this was a really good leader, you know, um, I'm not going to throw any names out there just to not start any kind of like problematic discourse. But like we think of this leader that's like, oh, wow, he was so great. And then you start like looking into him. It's like, oh, he didn't do some, he did, he did some things that weren't great. But it's like, I mean, that's kind of what Machiavelli is talking about. You have to look great, but not do great things to maintain power. Yeah. I, okay. So this is where I don't know if I necessarily would agree with him. Um, this whole notion of, um, you have to be everything, but also be nothing. Um, because, I'll, I'll say this, I don't know who said this, but this is a quote, you know, he who tries to control everything or try to hold everything holds nothing. Mm. So if you're trying to be everything, you're going to be nothing. Uh, which I, I guess in that regard, yeah, I guess that's what he does want you to do. But I still think that you should stand for something or have some defining feature, whether that be cruel unlike or like you have to have something you, I, I wouldn't recommend being ever a little bit of everything like no and so pick something and run with it are you saying a leader that's concerned with only being liked only being feared only being seen as cruel does it have very much going for him i'm saying if you like i'm saying that if you like okay i'm saying that you shouldn't focus on like everything and focus on one Okay. So, obviously, I, I would assume every leader would want to be liked, or mm -hmm. not even necessarily liked, but like supported. supported. Yeah, yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, there we go. Supported. We were on that. Yeah, we caught that. Yeah. So, I assume everyone would want to be supported. 
Um, but I wouldn't like focus on like, okay, I gotta get this group to support me, but I need this group to hate me. Like, I, no, no. Yeah, so like, I mean, that almost sounds like being too like cynical. That's the word. That's the word yeah. that threw me off guard earlier, where I completely lost my train of thought. Um, cynical, like not to be too cynical about like what groups you're you're affecting. Because you're, you're right. I think most leaders want to be liked, if not supported, at the very least. Um, but yeah, I think it. And it, this is something we can apply to everyday life. Actually, when you think about it that way, like you don't want to be so like not not even cynical but like so like over you you don't want to overthink everything to the point where like if i do this am i going to upset this person if i do this am i going to upset this friend is he going to think i'm like a bad person now is, am i doing everything i can to make sure he's a good person like and that's where the self-help thing comes in i guess if i was trying to bring it down mm -hmm. to that it's like uh you should and this is where i don't agree with him because and not that I agree with him at all, right? Let's get that out there. Um, there are some things that are very interesting about him and some things I would be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But like worrying too much about being liked is not necessarily good for your mental health in general. Like sometimes you need to figure out what it is you are and then just kind of express that and like vibrate that and not worry about like who you're pissing off and who you're like upsetting and who you're like really focusing on making happy and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, in student government, I mean, I know I'm not like some real elected uh, politician, but yeah, to a certain regard, extent, like, yeah, counts. yeah. I, I mean, I'm not. I'm uh, honestly, I'm not always sitting on my shoulders, like thinking, like, okay, is this action going to make me more like or less like? Mm -hmm. Like, that's not the first thing that always comes to mind. Like, it is a factor, sure, but it's not like the dominating thing. Yeah, and I don't know if it should because, and going along with what he says now, right? Like, sometimes some leaders have to make some very difficult decisions that aren't going to be very well publicly received, but mm -hmm. maybe were for the greater good. And that's where this question of the means justify the ends really comes into play. Like if you did something to ultimately benefit the greater amount of people in the country or even the world, are the bad things you did kind of justify me saying, okay, yeah, he did have to kill these people but because he did that, now we're experiencing economic growth. Now people aren't starving. Now people are, I mean, I don't, I don't envision a world. I don't see a world where that is like a likely outcome because you did something bad. Good things happen. But suppose that we were in a scenario that way, would it justify, would the bad things just be justified by the, the ends? I think, um, to a degree, like, I wouldn't say, I, I can't like I can't say what that degree like this is a threshold after this certain threshold like no slang acceptable I think on a case-by-case -case basis sure it, it could be fine it, it really depends on the circumstance the individual mm -hmm. circumstance so in Machiavelli's case no but <laughs> yeah, yeah right in his case definitely not um, at least not to a modern applications of it and I think a big part of this was taking this book with a grain of salt because it's 500 years old, it's outdated in some of the terminology, some of the lingo, some of the references, that if you don't come in it with an open mind, if you don't come in it with not taking everything he says 100% seriously because it gets really dark, as I've mentioned quite a few times now, um, I think you miss some of the points. I don't see a world where a leader would have to do something really bad and we say, yeah, but you know, it's because of this greater good. I, I don't know. But, I mean, you could almost, not even thinking about killing people, let's put it this way. The world is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. If we were to cut fossil fuels, that would be objectively bad because it would destroy economies, right? But if in the end, we save the planet and it turns out that more people live and we, you know, we reverse climate change and all this stuff, was that sudden shock of removing fossil fuels worth it because people died, countries were really destabilized and this kind of stuff. I'll let you answer first. Um, no, no, not just final either. No. No. Um, because, yeah, right now we're currently too heavily reliant on those. And so by cutting those, we were to suddenly cut those. Not even like... Not like if you just snapped those off, like not even that, like not even like a Thanos thing. But like even if you did like within like mm. let's say like the next 
two years, two years, we cut it completely. Like, no, that would cripple us. Um, maybe not as bad as like if you immediately just snapped and it was gone, but still be really bad. So, no, I think that in that regard, there needs to be a plan of action um, and, a, mm -hmm. and a transition. And I, I think that's, yeah. I think that's what Bacovelli even talks about a little bit too. Um, even though, like, he, you know, he was like saying you do have to be swift, firm, quick, mm -hmm. but. He also noted noted like there has to be a transitory phase mm -hmm. like once you come into power, appease the nobility, keep the people happy, mm -hmm. don't raise taxes for a while, let them you know give them the good stuff first, then you can start doing that. So he I think he recognizes also that there has to be like a transition period too. So I agree there has to be some kind of transition period which I think everybody is in in general consensus of. I'm gonna ask you something that I mentioned earlier, but. First, yeah, so doing the sudden shock, and it was just a very extreme example that came mm -hmm. into my mind, like right now, literally as we were speaking, but like, I don't know if, and this is this will weave into the next question, like what if there was like data and studies and there was like evidence to support that because you did that in a hundred years, the world would be a much better place. And that's, that's where I'm kind of torn because everybody would say, well, yeah, we need a transition period, but I don't know. It's like sometimes focusing on the now a little too a bit more important than focusing on the future. So that's like the question I'm thinking about in my head as we're speaking and as I run through the world, but how I would like revert it back to the audience or revert it back to you, the people listening and or watching is um, with Thanos if you have you seen the end game okay yeah i'm pretty sure everyone has seen at least infinity war or end game or kind of knows the premise at this point yeah, because we're, it's spo we're spoiling at this it's point. yeah i mean it's not even a spoiler alert like everyone has had it, have had to see it. it's like one of the most watched movies ever um was thanos machiavellian in the sense that he thought the means justified the ends because his whole thing was if i snap my fingers and eliminate half of the universe the other half will have the opportunity to prosper, grow, and live in a much better reality. So put it to to put it to that extent. And while you think about that question, shamelessly, I'm going to say, Monster, you could be sponsoring us. Um, these are off-brand Oreo cookies, but Oreo, if you want to be sponsoring us too, um, I will take that sponsor. Uh, Yeti microphones, I will take any sponsor, and I will not necessarily change my message, but maybe we can change the words around here and there. But anyways. Oh, no, yeah, I have my answer. No, no. <laughs> killing half the planet for the greater good of the other half is no, no. <laughs> because you're still killing half the planet. But uh, if you want to expand on it, uh, I'll let you expand on it. Do I have to? No, of course not. Because <laughs> it's pretty much uh, self-explanatory, right? Because you're immediately taking an act that will harm people now to maybe help people in the future and that's like that's where i think machiavelli gets it very wrong um i think that's where he gets it really wrong where he talks about whatever you do as long as you do it in hopes of keeping the status quo as long as you keep as long as you do it in hopes of prosperity and this kind of stuff whatever you do is okay and it's like no killing half the people is not, it's not okay quo. it's not okay no matter what your your ideology is taking Taking a life is almost never okay. Probably never okay. I'm still juggling with that philosophical question myself, but um, taking a life is, is not okay. And I, I don't care how Machiavelli justifies it or even like Thanos. Especially, in that, in, that, especially okay. in Thanos' case, in that regard, no, definitely not okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I would not support ruining half the planet, even mm -hmm. if I, even if I was part of the half that did make it and mm -hmm. I stand to benefit from it, no. Yeah, no, I mean, even if I was part of the half that wouldn't make it, I'm just, well, obviously you would be like, hell no, but, um, but it's interesting, like, so this is where we start to, like, grab things from Machiavelli and then apply them to everyday life. Like, I don't know if the writers of Endgame, the Rousseau brothers, were, like, read, read the prince, you know, but, like, that's a very Machiavellian concept mm -hmm. in and of itself, you know, like, the means justify the ends, the means being killing half of the, the universe for the ends being prosperity. And 
I mean, you know, that's some of the things that even though this is a very abstract book, we can kind of start to recognize these themes, these plots, because mm -hmm. there's plenty of movies that do that. Like, I'm willing to sacrifice this so that other people can, um, and I th that's where I think it's interesting that like some of these thoughts permeate through into like society, into real life. And it's not just some abstract philosophical book. Yeah, no, this book, while, like I said in the beginning, it talks about two, two different, like there's two tracks to it. One actually being a dictator and like running a country, the other half, things that you can apply to real life and um, to for self help. So, yeah, the, in this regard, like coming to power, being in charge, self help, this is what you should do to be effective. That way, in that regard, there is some good advice, but yeah, the means just by the ends. In this book, no, in almost, I would say, probably even for me, probably almost in all circumstances. Depending again on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. more more likely it probably would be no. And so let's take this a step further. I dropped a piece of cookie. Here we go. Messing up my name shirt. Um, let's take this a step further now. Um, and so the beginning of this conversation is a little mushy, especially because the book itself is mushy. You know, like it's all over the place. And so like we're all over the place. But like now we see that we're starting to like grab some like ideologies and kind of go with them. This is where I think it's very important for people to read this book because I really think it's important that people question their life, whatever happens, you know, everything that happens in their life, not just like take facts for granted and all these things, right? So when you're thinking about things that happen in the world and like strong ideas and perceptions you have of the world, question the ends and then think about the means, right? So mm, let's say very objectively, we don't have to talk about capitalism, but capitalism. What are the ends of capitalism and what are the means to get to those ends of capitalism? Communism. What are the ends of communism and what are the means and are they justifiable? You know, we have these convictions about capitalism good, communism bad, socialism somewhere in between. People think it's bad, people think it's good. You know, not touching on their uh, actual philosophies and their train of thoughts and stuff, but like if you were to add that element of questioning into your life, I think it'd be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I would not have done before I read this book. Yeah. Um, it's not, it, it, so it's never bad to like take a stock, take a, or take a second stock where you are, mm -hmm. ask questions, see if what you're doing is going to lead to the best potential outcome. Um, so when, when Machiavelli talked about that, I don't know where in the book, but, um, <laughs> Somewhere there, he probably yeah. Did. Somewhere um, in those hundred pages. No, I that's something I I could agree with. Yeah, because I, I, I'll say this again, but like we have these strong convictions about things, and we like I think sometimes we take some things for granted, like um, dictatorship bad, democracy good. Well, have there been good dictatorships? Have there been bad democracies? And it's like it's so easy to just like swing one side or you know take a firm stance on something but even like questioning some of the reasoning behind it you know some of the thoughts and processes behind it i think a lot of the issues we have could be solved if we just like stop and say hey you know what are we actually trying to achieve here um because there are dictators there are princes all around the world but mm -hmm. democracy seems to be on a rise so it's a good opportunity, and because we're so connected before, than we have ever been before, I think we have some really good opportunities to question each other um, so we can like start to recognize some of these things. Like, okay, is this person being Machiavellian? Um, instead of just throwing the word around and saying, oh, well, Trump was Machiavellian, Biden's Machiavellian, without even really understanding. Um, I think there's another one like draconian too like just words that get thrown around a lot and it's like orwellian or orwell gets thrown around a lot and it's like mm -hmm. yeah read the book but like even if you haven't read the book but you get some of it like that helps at least a little bit before you start throwing out just random words and stuff and that's why circle back to it that's why i think this book is really cool yeah i learned a lot from the book um you know if i were to become a dictator like Got some good advice. That's the manuscript. Yeah. Uh, got, got some good advice. Um, I'll be sure to have my servant um, read up on them and inform you some more finer details. Yeah. But um, 
then the self-help guide, like yeah, that I learned, there are a few things I learned there too. Um, taking stock of where you are. Um, now I'm blanking out because I don't remember a few of them, but like there, I, I have to go look back at a video of what, what was like the summary of it. But um, that, like taking, so can you say that again? So like. You know, taking a stock of where you are asking questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Keeping people close, but um, like remember mm -hmm. your your purpose or your end goal or whatever. So that too. Um, but yeah, like there were there were some good points. I, I don't remember it all right now. Yeah. Because, I, I wish I really took notes so I could read them, but like took some notes, but I I don't have. Them. Yeah. And so I I agree though. Like some of that self help, you know, like don't forget your your identity, don't lose yourself trying to appease or um, yeah. uh, piss other people off, you know, and then... Or another one, actually, now that I think mm -hmm. about another one that I remember, was the, uh, like, um, people who, like, just want to compliment you, completely, like, compliment oh, you all the time. yes. They don't, like, but, you know, it's not genuine, it's just, I guess, to gain your support or whatever. Yeah, like, so in general, taking a step back and trying to, like, realize your social atmosphere, I guess, would be a, a good, like, overarching concept. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, like some people are like, everyone has some kind of motive, right? Like, whether it's good or bad, that's either here or there. Like, and just recognizing, and that's not to say like sus suspect everyone, because we have friends, we meet people, and I like to think people are genuinely good, but sometimes being able to say, and I think it's something we talked about in a previous podcast episode, like sometimes being able to step back and recognizing when some things are happening, don't, don't necessarily put you on another level, or like, oh, I'm higher than people, but you know, maybe open up a different world where you're like, okay, I'm recognizing some of the things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's a big self-help thing. So maybe to start wrapping this up, I, I want to, I want to talk about, there's a, philo a, a Spanish philosopher. He, he's Brazilian, but lives in Mexico and he mainly does most of his content in Spanish. Mm -hmm. and there's a Spanish philosopher that like really took this question of, um, do the means justify the ends and put like a real, real world um, example of it, not like Thanos and stuff like that. Although it's kind of applicable. Um, he was talking about, um, he's a big critic of capitalism, but that's okay. beside the point. Um, he was talking about production. So he asked, um, and he asked it in Spanish, but I'll, I'll translate it in English real quick. It says, who cares? And this is a question he's asking. Um, it is something you should ask yourself. He, he says, who cares if slave labor is producing iPhones if the iPhones are connecting more people than ever before? So the end is that people are more connected than ever before, are using very nice, fancy devices. The means, slave labor in, in China, slave labor in all of these, um, these countries around the world. And that's like, that's something sometimes we don't even want to think about. Like, yeah, no. you know, I'm using all kinds of Apple products everywhere. And that's something, you know, like that's, that's an uncomfortable conversation to mm -hmm. have. But that's like a very Machiavellian thing, you know. Do the means justify the ends there? And as I, like I said earlier, all, in all instances, it's no. Um, but I, I would also say like, in this instance, I would also say like, it's like, Ethically, no, but like realistically, mm. I don't see life being any other way. So, while well, it is like terrible, yeah. So, like, re like being realistic, like there, me as an individual, I could stop buying Apple products. Like, I could stop. Like, that's not going to change. That's anything. not going to change the whole supply and demand. And plus, the world is so interconnected these days, globalized, that it, it, it wouldn't happen. Yeah, and so what does it take to stop that you know what does it take to stop slave labor from producing some of the commodities that we have in like first world countries and I, that's where i think if you just read this book and you thought oh well it's a manuscript on how to be a dictator and left it at that like you miss a lot of it and that's why i wanted to have this conversation too because when i was reading this book i thought okay he's got some things there about like the bad things kind of just are justified by the good things that happen. But when I heard this guy ta ask that question, I was like, damn, that's a real, real world application. As I'm watching him on my Apple computer, you know, it's like, it, it, you see some parallels there because there's a big campaign about uh, recycling, 
reduce reduce the amount of plastic you use, recycle the plastic you use. And the same philosopher was talking about how he used to work for um, a cookie company. He, he didn't want to say the name, but it was like something like Chips Ahoy or, or, or Oreo or something. And he was in charge of the packaging. And for some reason, he figured out that if he took like a millimeter off of the plastic on this that covers it, you could save trillions of tons of plastic a year like just by reducing because you know on one millimeter on one package doesn't make a difference but because they make millions and millions of packages in the aggregate eventually you start saving plastic yeah and he's like and i did that for like five years and i never made a dent on on any of the pollution or any of like saving plastics and he's like so this idea of and we might be like completely leaving machiavelli now with this, and I apologize for that, but this idea of like, it's up to the individual, especially when it comes to like fighting against corporations like this, which, you know, that's a different discussion or fighting against pollution and stuff is very hard to do when you're an individual. Yeah, the whole, uh, yeah, the arguments of, okay, it's you, the individual is like responsibility for climate change. Like, no, I like, I only use so much plastic compared to the, multi-millionaire corporation that's like building this like no they it's yeah. them i mean like yeah do, do individuals share some degree of responsibility of course yes but like do they like is it all on us like no it's not all on us it's mainly on the companies yeah. that supply us with this because this is the only way that we receive it yeah and there's this i i know many people have done this before because I, we did this in high school there's like this website that tracks um how much waste you consume a year? It's like, oh, you consume you you produce like uh, a ton of waste a year or whatever, and it's like they're kind of made to like guilt you into mm -hmm. like you know choosing paper, but in the grand scheme of things, you know that that doesn't really make a difference. So then that's when you start really questioning, you know, like what are the ends and the things that happen in between that make that end happen? Like, can we justify them? And, you know, I'm just trying to, like, tie this all together, right? But it, that's that's one of the biggest philosophical questions. I think if we asked ourselves that, we'd, we'd start not transcending, but starting to progress towards some kind of better future. Because we, we, can, because we talk about politics a lot, um, and we're both government majors, political science majors. It's like, and we talked about this last episode, we argue so much about the means that we forget that we have the same end sometimes to kind of change that like in general in america we want to be more free we're just that's the end we're just kind of arguing about how to get there you know we want people to have some kind of health health care we want health care but we're just arguing about the way to get there and if we recognize that we are arguing about means and not ends i think our conversations would be infinitely better because then we would recognize at least we have the same end in mind. We're just arguing about the means. Yeah. Um, the sausage, um, what's it like the saying? The sausage making process can get messy. Um, everyone wants like, okay, everyone wants to bake <laughs> it or whatever, one. but like to make it, like to cut, like to make all that stuff, like it, it gets messy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but that's such is life. Yeah, such is life. and. I, I appreciate this book very much because it got me thinking about the world in a very, very, very different way. And listening to this this philosopher um, talk about stuff, I was like, okay, like I could think of some real world examples, but once he like said, I, you know, stated that, and once I started thinking about, okay, well, Thanos, that's not a real world example, but like it happened in the movie. So that's like, there's an archetype, there's a theme there. Um, I really started questioning a lot of things in life. And it's not to say, we would have to have a whole another conversation about capitalism, but that's not to say everyone needs to like, everyone needs to question their life, but that's not to say everyone like absolutely right now needs to question their life and think about the means to the ends because mm -hmm. some people are just trying to survive and don't have the opportunity to think about the means and the ends. But if you have the opportunity to read The Prince, it looks like a big book here. It's not that big. It's like a hundred pages. Yeah, this one's actually really smaller. Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. that's my personal one. I, I, you know, I, I really like the book. Um, just because of the way it changed my outlook on life, not because I'm adopting and not because we are adopting the things he's saying, just because it probes you in a different way. Um, and that, that that's why I would really recommend this book. Yeah, you don't have to fear us eliminating our opponents or taking them out like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
we're not going to become dictators overnight. Not that we want to. Uh, you know, maybe. Um, who knows? Who knows what the future has in store for us? But if I could leave you with one thing, it's going to be don't don't necessarily take things for granted, um, and definitely question the world around you. So. Yeah, don't get complacent. Yeah, don't get complacent because, it, 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 that, I, I mean, there's just so much in this book because well, the way we say complacent is is exactly what Machiavelli is saying that a ruler needs. He needs people to be complacent with those little um, increments of, of doing good things so you can be addicted to it. You're complacent and you're addicted to that bread. You know, in this example, it's bread, right? They give you... they. Um, they give them bread every like Friday or every Thursday or something like you get addicted to these little good things You start becoming complacent. It's like, okay, well, he's doing bad things But at least he's you know doing something for us and we start getting complacent with these things It's like always question the people in power because as good as they may be um, There's always room for malice and I'm I mean That's harsh because there's a lot of like political leaders. I admire and things like that, but there's always room for malice um, so that's why that's why I think at least having some kind of background or foundation on this kind of way of thinking mm -hmm. is beneficial. Yeah, definitely. And one very, very last thing. You don't have to be a political science major. You don't have to be a philosophy major. You don't have to be a government major. You don't have to be anything. You can just be yourself and read this book. You can just be yourself and read any kind of philosophy book. So don't feel pressured because we're university students. Um, reading this book and like you know because sometimes there's like this stigma around like oh i'll never read philosophy because that's for like philosophers and stuff you know and i think one of the most beautiful things is like when ordinary people can just jump in to read a book and say hey you know what let me question the world in a different way because come in the, the realization that you don't necessarily know why you think the things you think and like trying to explore that is like a very beautiful self journey mm -hmm. um and I'll kind of leave it at that. I recommend the book. Um, if you have any final things to say, yeah, no, I think it's a great book. Um, it, it, you know, don't necessarily you don't have, if you were to read this book, doesn't necessarily have to be for like the being a dictator aspect, but just for the self help aspect because there's really good tidbits and knowledge on that. And I, I would also recommend watching a summary after reading the book because you probably will need it. Yeah, so I, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> go on YouTube and. You know, just write Machiavelli. Um, there are plenty of philosophers and plenty of like educational channels that kind of tell you some of the underlying things about it that like don't necessarily focus on the dictator stuff. We focus more on the status quo stuff we were talking about that I think are beneficial. But um, I, I appreciate the conversation. Um, I apologize if I would cut you off. No, um, you're fine. And we lost our we lost our train of thought a couple of times, but. It's natural when you're reading a book like this because there's so many different angles, you know, like it's a hundred pages, give or take, but there's just so many sections and there's so many case studies. Um, and that's not to like sound like it's overwhelming. No, I don't necessarily think it is if you just take it one bit at a time. And the, the English is different, but it's not like impossible to read, but I, I, I recommend it. Yeah. So I, again, thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, if you want to come back, we can talk about another book or politics, capitalism, or not politics, anything else, uh, I'd love to have you. Yeah, most, yeah, definitely. Sweet. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening, whichever um, way that you consume this podcast. If you could like, share, give us a comment, uh, follow the Instagram. We'll have it linked in the description. But anyway.